They just pay it because they make more money uh, selling drugs. They can recoup the cost uh, with their profits. And treatment guidelines are just another way of dictating uh, profits and bullying doctors. This is a recent article called Guidelines, uh, Guides to Profit, which explains how financial relationships have corrupted the whole guideline process. This is an article I showed last year that showed that these treatment guidelines, even though they're becoming more and more prevalent, um, they're based largely on uh, so-called level three evidence, which is opinion, which makes them very dangerous. This article states that uh, physicians should remain very cautious when using treatment guidelines as the sole source of patient care, but unfortunately a lot of them do because we put out business in a lot of cases if they don't. And this is another article which I showed last year showing that uh, compliance with treatment guidelines may actually be fatal. You may actually uh, do more damage to the patients than if you did treat them according to the treatment guidelines. So I'm going to apply this to Lyme disease. This is the infamous uh, Attorney General Blumenthal's investigation of the IDSA treatment guidelines for Lyme disease. He found that the, uh, the process in which they were drafted was riddled with corruption. Um, he, they were forced to uh, revisit their guidelines, but they, uh, they held a hearing and they ended up not changing anything. So they just went on business, business as usual with these guidelines that are keeping thousands and thousands of people sick. So this is all due to what's called the Steer Camp of Lyme Disease Treatment. Uh, this is Alan Steer. This is a Wikipedia article just showing the so-called Lyme disease controversy. Um, Steer support for the medical view that patients with chronic Lyme disease often have no evidence of Lyme disease, so therefore they don't get treated. This is what uh, some people call protecting the patient or patents and not patients. And this all ties into the Lyme disease vaccine, which uh, Alan Steer was heavily involved with. He actually led the research effort for the Lyme race, which was a uh, GlaxoSmithKline vaccine. So Alistair is famous, famous for saying that Lyme disease is overdiagnosed and overtreated. In other words, it's also hard to catch and easy to cure. This is an interesting, in the New York, interesting article in the New York Times, an article about Steer. It's called Stalking Dr. Steer Over Lyme Disease. It states, in the realm of Lyme disease, few are as influential as Dr. Steer. Interestingly, a lot of his patients seem to despise him. He says, last year, Dr. Alan Steer, one of the world's renowned medical researchers and rheumatologists, began to fear his patients. Uh, the reason he feared them was because he wouldn't treat them in a lot of cases. The, the world's foremost expert on his illness did not believe many of them even had Lyme disease. And he had refused to, to treat them with antibiotics, uh, mainly long-term antibiotics. So if the world's foremost expert on a disease doesn't want to treat you for it, what do you do? Well, you can go get a second opinion. Uh, but it gets better or worse depending on your perspective. Uh, due to Steer's influence, insurance companies have refused to pay for continuing treatments for Lyme. Uh, so even if you had a second opinion and the doctor wanted to treat you, a lot of times they'll give you my insurance coverage. And uh, if they're not put out of business, uh, you will have to pay out of pocket. It's happening all over the country, happening to my doctor. So this is a diagram I do try to explain, just an overview of how these treatment guidelines are used by pharmaceuticals and insurance companies to deny uh, patients treatment, and they do it indirectly. So the ph pharmaceuticals companies and the insurance companies would love to be able to tell doctors how to prescribe, because they make a lot of money if they can force a doctor to give uh, patients their drugs. Uh, but that would be too obvious, so they use treatment guidelines. So they can point to the treatment guidelines and say, you know, this is the best evidence, this is what you need to give your patients. Uh, that would be one way to do it, but even that would be a little too obvious. So they've used this so-called third-party strategy where they fund these third-party groups to draft these treatment guidelines. Um, There's an article by Teresa Fercatus who says, they promote organizations that appear to be spontaneous initiatives and are in reality supported and run by citizens that work for the pharmaceuticals companies. So these third-party groups include nonprofits, and medical societies like the IDSA, which have these thought leaders like the steer camp experts and the continuing education groups, and they all point to these treatment guidelines, which allows the pharmaceuticals companies to dictate treatment guidelines kind of on the dotted line, and that restricts choice for medical treatment for patients, which ends up translating into money for the pharmaceuticals companies that feeds back into the system and gives them more money to control the entire system. So who benefits from this whole system? Well, Helen Steer 
And the company he was, or the university he was working for, Yale Corporation, uh, was actually working on a vaccine the whole time. He was denying patients uh, antibiotics in the early days of the Lyme epidemic. Um, and he actually followed through and led the, uh, the field studies on the first Lyme vaccine, the Lyme Rex vaccine. Uh, this was a, a disaster for patients because it induced the very symptoms it was supposed to uh, prevent. Ospe vaccine was pulled from the market. Uh, this is an article by Steer stating that the way they developed the vaccine was they had a unique set of uh, serum samples from untreated patients which were monitored throughout the course of the Lyme disease in the late 70s prior to the use of antibiotic therapy for this illness. What he doesn't say is that Steer was one of the main reasons that they didn't have antibiotic theory or antibiotic uh, therapy for the illness. So this allows him and his employer to monitor the immune response of these patients that can develop a vaccine. He states, only with this set of serum samples is it possible to, to determine how the antibody response to Borrelia burgdorferi develop and change during the various stages of the illness. So they were actually able to watch the immune system over a long period of time so they can map it out and try to mimic it in the vaccine. This is a more recent article explaining uh, this rationale. Uh, if you monitor the immune response directed against uh, multiple spirochetal proteins generated throughout the course of the infection, you can use that information to develop a vaccine. This is a statement by Karen uh, Forstner, who is the founder of the Lyme Disease Foundation. She states that uh, we're trying to find answers, and the biggest problem is self-appointed gatekeepers like Alan Steer. Well, we now know that Steer is not a self-appointed gatekeeper. Uh, he's a CDC biowarfare epidemiologist and a pharmaceuticals consultant, and he's been wrong from the very beginning of the epidemic. But he's always wrong in the right direction for pharmaceuticals interests, and coincidentally, he's a pharmaceuticals consultant. Um, he's also right in the direction for vaccine research and symptom treatment. So this is a, just a quick overview of the steer camp, some, uh, the steer camp history. So they initially denied antibiotics work at all against Lyme disease. They stated it was a virus. So they had, uh, recommended no antibiotics be given. Then they suddenly switched positions and claimed that antibiotics were nearly miraculous. And therefore, only short courses of antibiotics were necessary. And they still maintain that long-term antibiotics is useless and even dangerous. They can they even call some doctors who administer administer the murderers if their patients have to die. Uh, the Klepper study on long-term antibiotics administration did not even administer long-term antibiotics as like part of the steer camp. Um, so these positions have an overarching coherence. They're designed to deny long-term antibiotics administration for Lyme disease, which is often necessary. So these, these steer camp positions have been institutionalized in the infamous treatment guidelines. Uh, lead author was uh, Gary Wormser. They were actually investigated by Attorney General of Connecticut, Blumenthal, as I mentioned. But curiously, in order to be an expert on Lyme disease, you have to be a member of the so-called steer camp of treatment. Uh, this is just a quick overview of some of Steer's publications over the years. This is his paper in 1993 stating that uh, Lyme disease was overdiagnosed. This is the start of the hard to cure, or hard to catch, easy to cure mythology that's been perpetuated. Uh, this is one of Steer's early virus, uh, early papers from the 70s, where he stated that uh, Lyme disease uh, may be caused by a virus. It wasn't that symptomatic treatment only is in, is advised. This is a common theme throughout the epidemic. This is an article, or a book written by uh, Jonathan Edlow called Bullseye. He states if the causative agent was shown to be a bacterium then the imperative to treat would have been greater. So by calling it a, a line, or proposing that as a Lyme virus, this allows, uh, provided them with an excuse not to treat people with antibiotics, because you don't treat viruses with antibiotics. This is another paper that's here published. Uh, this is a non-existing uh, tick vector that he claims was correlated with the Lyme disease epidemic, it's Odes Denny. It turned out this species of tick didn't even exist. Again, uh, Dr. Edlow states that the change, in, the change in nomenclature was not without its effect, for it meant that doctors could not legitimately make a diagnosis of Lyme disease in states where the vector was not found. So this was just another excuse for restricting the treatment of Lyme disease. It turned out uh, the species of tick didn't exist. So Steer and his cohorts have been making a career doing research on a disease that they say pretty much doesn't exist, at least in the long term. Another statement by uh, Steer in a publication in the 70s, he stated that we remain skeptical of antibiotic 
that therapy helps. Of course, it's universally treated uh, antibiotic therapy now. And again, it says that, uh, this is in 1978, it appears that at this point that only symptomatic treatment is feasible. Again, this is the common theme. And this is an article from just several months ago, and Steer is still stating the same, uh, taking the same position. This is a New York Times article. They're claiming that uh, when patients relapse, it's largely due to new infections instead of the relapse. This is the, the big controversy. Controversy over Lyme disease, whether it's a relapsing disease due to an ongoing infection. And, and the New York Times article states um, that Steer admits that the symptoms, sometimes disabling ones, do linger for months after treatment in as many as 10% of his patients. Uh, the doctors do, know not, do not know why, but Dr. Steer said antibiotics are not the answer. So if there's one thing you know, that Steer knows, it's antibiotics are not the answer. Uh, this is one of his papers stating that uh, one or two months of antibiotics with doxycycline uh, should be sufficient. And if it's not, then he treats with anti-inflammatory agents. Um, began with doxycycline, this is Dr. Wormser's paper. Wormser, again, is the lead author of the treatment guidelines. He states that even a single dose of doxycycline uh, can prevent the development of Lyme disease if you're bitten by a tick. So the media just regurgitates this so-called steer camp propaganda. This is a New York Times article stating that uh, basically Lyme disease can be stopped in its tracks with a single dose of antibiotic, which is ridiculous because I don't know of any disease that can be stopped with a single dose of antibiotics, especially one that's the most complicated in the world. Um, so I ask, is any statement too absurd for these established in Lyme experts? Curiously, these uh, doxycycline treatments actually induce so-called round body formation in a quiescence of symptoms rather than a cure, uh, which means the disease can go into remission and appear to be cured only to come back later and wreak havoc. So I ask, why are the world's foremost experts on Lyme disease recommending treatments that are likely to induce the organism to form a protective cyst and thereby, thereby cause a relapsing, undetectable, and possibly incurable form of disease? So this is a uh, summary statement from Dr. Ed Masters uh, on the history of errors made by the, star, by, by the uh, steer camp. He states, uh, first off, they said Lyme disease was a new, new disease, which it isn't, it wasn't. Then it was thought to be viral, but it isn't. Then it was thought that serum negativity didn't exist, which it does. Then they thought it was easily treated by short courses of antibiotics, which it sometimes isn't. Then it was only the Ixodes demony tick, which we now know is not even a separate valid tick species. So Masters goes on to say, if you look throughout history, almost every time a major dogmatic statement has been made about, we know, about what we know about this disease, it was subsequently proven wrong or underwent major modifications. So what do all these errors have in common? They're right, or they're wrong in the right direction. They effectively justify symptom treatment only for Lyme disease, which is what Alice Deere's been uh, proposing since the early 70s. So these policies, I claim, are uh, tailor-made to make the disease very difficult to diagnose, uh, very dangerous to treat for doctors, and very expensive to treat for patients. Uh, this is, again, a Wikipedia article stating that although Lyme disease is presented as a symptom, this simple illness by these steer camp experts, uh, it has a multifaceted appearance and nonspecific symptoms. Uh, it's called the great imitator. This makes it a nightmare to diagnose and treat. It can, be, uh, it can masquerade as uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, lupus, Crohn's, etc., etc. So this is a nightmare for patients and doctors, and it's presented as a simple-minded disease. But ultimately, it's dominated by the pharmaceuticals industry and consultants, and it's also dominated by biowarfare experts, and it's uh, being used as a vaccine development effort coordinated by biodefense institutions and researchers. Yeah, I'm going to skip to the uh, vaccine marketing part of the talk. Okay, I believe the whole tri treatment denial uh, scenario is actually orchestrated uh, to favor symptom treatments or root cause treatment and vaccine development and vaccine marketing. Again, Steer led the, uh, not only the early investigation,
Constitution into Lyme disease from the 70s, but all the way into the 90s. He led the first uh, field trials for the Lyme Rex vaccine. Uh, this is an article by Smith, Klein, Beecham, thanking Dr. Steer for his help in conducting the uh, efficacy trials. They state, in this regard, we are indebted to Alan Steer, whose advice on evaluating the adverse events, especially the serious adverse events, has been invaluable. Steer was an expert on adverse events because he did watch patients suffer from Lyme disease his whole career. Again, this is uh, the vaccine was developed because they had a unique set of serial samples from untreated patients monitored throughout the course of the disease. And only with this set of serial samples was it possible to watch the antibody response develop. Um, this is Steer's employer was Yale University. This is one of the patents on the OSPE vaccine. This is uh, patent by Smith, Klein, and Beecham on uh, another OSPE vaccine component. This is a statement by Warnser, who's also the lead author for the uh, treatment guidelines, stating that uh, this is the reason you want to monitor patients over a long period of time. Basically, they saw that patients who had uh, short-term Lyme disease were able to be reinfected, but patients who had so-called late manifestations did not seem to be reinfected. So it was as if the immune system developed over a period of time with a long-term infection. Uh, so if they could learn what exactly was uh, developing of which immune components were responsible to use that in a vaccine. So the longer the patients are infected with untreated Lyme, the more immune they appear to future infections. And this might allow them to mimic uh, natural forms of immunity, immunity in a vaccine. Again, this is the Tuskegee rationale which stated uh, if you have a chronic disease such as syphilis, uh, this necessitates a long-term study of the natural history uh, of the disease before the effectiveness of programs uh, for the control of the disease can be evaluated properly, such as uh, vaccines. Again, uh, I think what they're doing is making the vaccine look uh, cost-effective compared to an untreated epidemic. I'm going to get more into the details now. This is the uh, the article on the CDC authors, the uh, cost effectiveness, the cost effectiveness of vaccinating against Lyme disease. And I believe this is the so-called blueprint for the steer camp of Lyme disease treatment. Um, this is another article here stating, uh, this is by, I'm sorry, this is the Meltzer article again. This was the summary of the article where they state that uh, few communities have average annual incidences of Lyme disease greater than half a percent. But what they found out was that the economic, the economic benefits of the vaccines will be greatest uh, in individuals who have a risk of, uh, or a probability of contracting Lyme disease greater than 1%. So this was a problem. Uh, communities that had half percent probability of Lyme, that was in the high region. And what they needed was uh, communities that had a greater than 1% chance of contracting Lyme for the vaccine to be cost effective. And uh, this is the cost-effectiveness formula here on the right that they used. This is another article with a similar title, The Cost-Effectiveness of Vaccination Against Lyme Disease. Uh, this was supported by the NIH. And again, their conclusion was the vaccine would only be economically attractive for individuals who have a probability of getting Lyme disease greater than 1%. Uh, again, this is the cost-effectiveness formula on the right. And these are some curves on the left which they plot. So on the bottom here you have, this is the probability of getting Lyme disease. 